Welcome back to D&D Beyond. I am very excited today to get into customizing your characters, the things you can do for who they are. And I have brought uh, with me one of my very favorite people to roll dice with in the whole world, oh. from Relics and Rarities to Shakar. Please welcome Xander Genre. How you doing? Hello. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Look at you. Look at you on the D&D Beyond Twitch. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of like, look at us. Look at here Yay. we are talking D&D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. But first of all, I love this because this has been something that was on my mind uh, because mm. folks watching might be familiar. We have talked on this channel uh, a couple of times before I got here about versions of this topic, uh, including a wonderful video that Todd and Lauren made last fall all about the ways that you can customize your character sheet with custom actions and abilities and a lot of the stuff that you can just leave as notes for yourself right there. Uh, and then more recently, Joe and crew had talked about the idea of tailoring your spells to express character um, with Riley Silverman and Jeremy Bloom. Uh, oh, and so ooh, ooh, ooh. I want, I, I know, it's, it's, it's a real fun. Of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and talking to Xander about what me, we might want to do on D&D Beyond, you had actually suggested that this is something I know you do really well in your games, and I uh -huh. would love a chance to talk a little about what we mean when we, when we talk about these kinds of tailorings. And then in the second half today, we're going to practice by pulling mm. up a character in D&D Beyond and writing out some of our customizations. So we'll, we will kit out uh, a, a, a dwarf cleric today um, on the show. So that's the plan. Uh, but first, Xander, philosophically speaking, you are one of the strongest yeah. performers I know. You're one of the most creative people I know. Uh, no pressure, you know. Thank I'm just you. saying you operate at like a 10 all the time. Ah! What is your <laughs> philosophy uh, when you're putting together a character on tailoring and personalizing these things to your character? Yeah, well, um, I think that I have to take into account what sort of table I'm going to be playing with. If this is something mm. that I know is going to be put together for a show or broadcast, then I try to think, what do I want to showcase? What sort of either game mechanic or personality trait or something, what do I want to play with? And normally it's different than whatever I played last. So if I was like a sneaky roguelike character, I want to go the other way and play like a goody two-shoes cleric or something, you know, along those lines. Um, <laughs> Whereas if so I'm you're giving away home... our secrets. I don't think yeah. they know that a bunch of us as performers were like, what do I want to do next? Where I was like, hmm, I was a doctor. Now I'll punch things. Exactly. <laughs> like, you just want to try operate. on like the different uh, things. And that's what role playing games are for, baby. <laughs> so true. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. If it's at home, though, like no rules. I go wild. <laughs> and I just most of the time I try to make my friends laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a specific style of playing role-playing games, and it's not for everybody. Disclaimer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. Can you give us uh, an example? Maybe uh, some choices that you've made with a character? Yes. Um, I know one in particular that was upsetting at a table was I made a character that was full of bees, uh, and they commanded the bees, and the bees did whatever they wanted to, but it it freaked a lot of people out at the table, and the things that we had to imagine, it just wasn't great. <laughs> But uh, on broadcast, uh, one of my favorite characters was Ricky Huckster from, uh, as you mentioned, the series Relics and Rarities, uh, who is uh, a druid, but I customized him uh, to be sort of an alchemist potions master. So he was casting druid spells, but I would always have some sort of description of the vial or mechanic that it was deployed uh, whether it be like from natural ingredients put together or something he had him in his many pockets. Uh, and so I have a, a lot of characters that I do because that is one of my favorite things. I love a good theme to a character. Uh, happy Pride, everybody. Uh, <laughs> that is my jam. Like, uh, oh, so good. So uh, <laughs> is there a particular thing you would call it from Ricky from his alchemical bag of tricks that you, you enjoyed uh, deploying? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, sort of as a disclaimer, I want to say if anybody else is trying to do this, I highly recommend it. But also keep in contact with your dungeon master because you want to make sure that the things that you're doing, you're going to have fun doing it and they're going to have fun sort of going along the descriptive journey with you. And it's something that you both can play off of each other in the scenario. 
Um, also, the second thing I would say is maybe don't play precious to things too much either. Be flexible with how things work and be willing to change with how the DM says, okay, but it's going to go this way, you know? <laughs> um, but that being said, before we started uh, filming for Relics, we had the great opportunity to get together as a cast. Uh, and so I hashed this out with uh, the amazing Deborah Ann Wall, who was our dungeon master for that uh, that uh, adventure. And I pitched the idea of I want to play an alchemist type character who uh, is like a traveling salesman. And his whole thing is that he's like the characteristics are he's greedy. He doesn't like want to give up money and he wants to sell uh, like fake potions to people, but actually know how to make the magical potions for the adventures and things. So with those two character concepts, that's how Ricky Huckster was sort of born. Uh, and then having those in the back of my mind for the scenarios that you come into, uh, it really informs how to play the character and the relationship between that character and the other uh, members of the party and NPCs as well. That's amazing advice. I will say consulting with the DM can also be very productive uh, when you're doing this stuff because it may, in some cases, you may be like, well, if I can just turn anything into anything, then I, mm. I feel like I'm unmoored. I, what are the limits there? And you can sometimes find if they're like, you know, that's really not a reasonable thing for us to do with Magic Missile. That might inspire mm. you to go digging for a spell you hadn't considered or an, yes. a, a feat that you didn't think of taking, um, which could, could inspire like using the rules to your advantage and then reflavoring them to get the thing you want. Yeah. Absolutely. One of my favorite uh, characters that I've done for a home game, uh, and this was something that my mods uh, from my community had thrown together for my birthday and things like that, but I would play a, a magical girl warlock, and she transforms, and instead of uh, like sticking to the theme and, and branching out and uh, making things conform to that theme, I instead created restrictions to her. So if she only did fire magic, those are the only spells that she knew. So there are ways to customize it so that any spell you can make, oh, well, I'm going to use fire in the healing capacity or in some uh, illusory capacity. But it's super fun to put limitations on the character who only wants to blow things up and set things on fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if you do have any questions for us today, by the way, please go ahead and put those in chat with the word question and our amazing mods are gathering those up and passing them on to me as we get into this, uh, because this is a lot of fun. <laughs> but let's see. Do you want to get yeah. into it? Do you want to just let's start building yeah. well, ourselves? I... Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say there are a, a lot of examples of this for spellcasters, of course. So Ricky, as I had mentioned, is a druid, but you had mentioned the other show that I'm a part of, Shikar. Uh, and in that, I play a, a monk who is dabbling in other classes right now. But I wanted to show like the versatility of that as well, because when I was looking at, I wanted to play someone fighty, uh, like on the front lines, because I'm always a spellcaster. Uh, but when I was looking at like the flurry of blows and things like that, it had the descriptions of uh, like bludgeoning attacks. And it's like, you can punch, kick, or headbutt. And I was like, oh, what if it's a monk that only headbutts? <laughs> and so just going off of that, like what sort of issues would that create? He has memory problems because he uses his head constantly to fight, but it's his strongest asset. Uh, and I worked with my DM, Jasmine, who is that bronze girl on Twitch. Amazing. Again, I am just blessed with the incredible dms um but you know she worked with me in that i was like oh i want him to have a headband and she's like what if it's a magic item that's plus one to your armor that's why he has it and can use that and it's just been so fun to develop that now i'm also going to imagine your monk as like someone doing constant headers in soccer uh, or, yes, or... <laughs> that's exactly what happens. And like <laughs> speed, di like dive bombing at people. Uh, in the most recent one shot, he like jumped up and full on uh, came down like a meteor with his head first and crushed through a barrier. It was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's a great example of how you don't have to. We we've we've talked about spells as a specific focus for tailoring, but of course, like you do with did with flurry of blows, that could apply to a mm. lot of things. Are there other yeah. areas where you have found it uh, especially helpful to flavor things? Yes. 
So uh, one of the shows that I did for the Eberron campaign was called Dark Lanterns, uh, and that was for the release of that book. Uh, and I played a a bard, but I wanted to uh, a, go on the dancing side of bard. So I uh, I made a, a healing halfling or a mark of healing halfling that was local to that sort of setting. Uh, and he would use uh, the, oh no, I just blanked on what the spell was called, but it's the, the mage hand to sort of, um, he had a wrap around his waist. He would spin around, use mage hand to fling it out, and he would use them as like aerial silks to catch enemies, uh, wrap them up to use them like Spider-Man and swing along. Uh, so it's that combination of the light weight of the sash, the dancing with the twirling and use of mage hand to attach it to something. <laughs> And again, Gaurav Gulati was so generous as a DM. <laughs> uh, that also, we've been talking about the the Unearthed Arcana that just came out. Include uh, for Strixhaven includes all these potential colleges and the Prismari Bards. We were talking last week. They're basically dancers. Mm. There's all this Incredible. movement stuff, and I, I'm so yes. excited. <laughs> oh, and to describe that too, it's so freeing to be like, oh, and we hit this pose, and boom, boom, boom. Ah. Oh. So much fun. What I love is that you also, if you're not accustomed to thinking this way, playing something like a bard could be, I think, a great way to sort of test out whether this is fun for you because bards kind of automatically do this. Your version yeah. of doing magic, your way of expressing yourself, which instrument you pick. Uh, obviously, there's also, you know, mechanical colleges and, and things like every class has has ways of expressing itself differently. Clerics have symbols. Yes. Uh, but all of that can lend itself to thinking along these lines. Um, so, yeah. you know, plug for bards, as usual. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, but bards. again, like finding finding, yeah. <laughs> uh, finding a theme and sort of sticking with it. Uh, one of the fun ways, you know, there there's Humblewood and things like that that are out there for animal type characters. Um, but one of the shows that I do called Failed Save, a bonus thing that we do is we visit the pets of our characters. So we have petisodes and I play a curious cat warlock. And so theming everything like prestidigita prestidigitation is just cleaning the fur and things like that. And the, uh, <laughs> uh, what's it called? Eldritch Blast is a paw print that shoots out. It's been so fun. <laughs> um, and an extremely biased shout out to Failed Save, an incredibly fun show that everyone should Yay! be watching. Uh, Absolutely. I, we have some great questions actually coming in from chat. Uh, Ooh, and. I'm here. Uh, I love this, especially because, Xander, you are an amazing player, but you are, of course, also a DM. Uh, so I'm going to yes. put the hard questions to you. Um, okay. Olivia Mulligan asks, at what point do you draw the line between just reskinning a class and going to homebrew? Is the limit your imagination or do you have a more concrete line? Yeah, and I think all of this boils down to what is your table looking to get out of the game? Is this a fun Saturday where tipsy kind of just like <laughs> screwing around? If that's the case... Fun is the rule. Um, but if it's something where, you know, the majority of the table wants to either play through this adventure or go on a longer campaign, that's, again, something to talk to your DM about. And, and mm -hmm. even uh, after you've started, checking in with your DM, being like, hey, when this was happening, was this okay? Ever, after every mm. sort of exchange. Um, one of my favorite things to do as a player is you can support other players' decisions like that in... Uh, let's say your wizard casts magic missile. Me as the rogue could be like, oh, but wait, what does that look like? I love prompting other people to describe sort of what their magic look like because I know the DM has a lot to consider. Um, and so they may be swamped with the descriptions as well. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah. It's a great small way to do table support, which I think speaks to, we have a, a very similar question uh, from Luxor5013 who's saying from the DM side of things, how do you balance something that is original and individual, but could take away from the group as a whole? Now, I think ah. that's a great question. Uh, it, and the, I think the short answer is gonna come down to feeling it out in play. Uh, mm. Because I think we, we've all been at tables where one person's incredibly cool move feels like a win for everybody. Um, and we've probably yeah. all had some experience at tables with sort of things where you're like, okay, well, this is taking enough time or happening frequently enough that it might be kind of throwing off the balance of the group. 
Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the unfun version is like, you just kind of have to trial and error those things and listen to each other. But Xander, do you have any secrets, any shortcuts to figuring this out? Yes, I do. From the DM side of it, it's negotiate with your player. Uh, mm. because they're going to try to do what their imagination wants to do, and you want to encourage that. That's what we're here to do. We're playing, and we're letting our fantasies go wild, but there, there's sort of a, an unspoken thing that we all have. We are playing a game, and there are rules. So as a DM, I will try as much as, can, as I can to be like, I hear what you're saying. I love your intention. Here's what can be done, and negotiate down into like, okay, it's going to depend on a role or a couple of, of skill checks, or... Uh, this spell doesn't quite work like that, but I'll give it to you in this capacity. Uh, and so that way it's still keeping it lighthearted and it's not completely shutting down somebody's idea at the table. And it could also invite other players to chime in as well. Uh, keeping that, that mind of not playing precious to your ideas or your customization, sometimes other people can get on the fun. Like, ooh, I wanna, I wanna, if your outfit looked a little bit like this, wouldn't that be great? And you can collaboratively come up uh, with these different tweaks. Absolutely. And that's where one of those classic questions comes in as a DM, where you can say, okay, what are you trying to do? Um, yeah. And help to clarify. And then instead or of being how like, do you, you want know, to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly Someone loaded, said but very once. effective. <laughs> you know, uh, I think it was Abria, actually. Uh, oh, I think so too. Ah. I'm sorry. Just so excited. Uh, yeah. Okay. But, um, all that aside, uh, me just hanging out with friends on the internet with all y'all who are also our friends. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the what are you trying to do question can prompt uh, alternatives, essentially. When you, when you have mm. to be sort of the, I'm delivering the bad news that that is not going to work the way you hope it will, um, finding out what they are aiming for can help you to be like, you know, that's not going to work on that wall, but mm. here is what you could try uh, without telling them which actions to take. You can offer alternatives of like, yeah. do you want to use that to check on this? Um, only with one of my favorite, One of my favorite ways to flavor that when delivering that news to players too, uh, we're all under the assumption that our characters are different than ourselves. So sometimes our character knows better than we do. So I will say, you as a, a rogue know that this is not going to work in that way, but your mind is thinking of other solutions and may come up with something else. Can you roll a sleight of hand, you know? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Just playing into the be like, well, you know, you made a character with all this experience and I'm just deferring yes. to what they already know. Good job, you yeah. making a person who would know that. Totally. You're so good. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Ooh, I get goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of it says, I find the struggle with reflavoring is that often mm. the flavor makes it seem like it should do a different type of damage, which can potentially affect balance. How yeah. do you handle situations uh, where your flavor should make a spell that does radiant into cold damage or something like that? Keep the base damage type, change it to match the flavor or something else. That is a great question, and I think I would take it spell by spell with my DM again. Um, mm. Most of the time, if I'm flavoring something, that's a lot of pressure on the DM to remember what I'm doing. Uh, and so I try to keep uh, the effects of the spell as close to the intended effects as possible. That includes the type of damage, the range, uh, the area effect, the, the capacity, that sort of thing because those are the understood rules. And so where the flavor comes in is again the negotiating, where, um, okay, your radiant damage may look like it's an icy blast of cold, but really the ice crystals are reflecting the light in a certain way, and the prisms are creating radiant, you know, just a, a creative way to say, okay, it may look this way, but it's still doing the intended effect. I think that's usually where I would come down as well, is that I, it, especially because I don't tend to do a lot uh, in my games of like monkeying with the way spells function. I haven't <laughs> jumped that much into that side of homebrew. Um, so mm. I find it simpler to leave that mechanic in place and just justify mm -hmm. narratively or creatively why it's sort of like, you know, cold things can burn in their own yeah. way, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah, and then uh, like, like, not changing the damage to ice, but keeping it as fire, I think it just keeps everything simple. 
because I know I don't have the whole thing memorized, so I have to ask my players constantly, like, oh, remind me what that spell does, and there's a level of trust there. And if you're saying, well, I homebrewed this, so it's cold damage, I'm like, oh, okay, but what does D&D Beyond say? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but and of there, course, you if know. you work with your DM and decide to switch that up, that is actually possible to do. Um, yes, but, uh, and there's a great tool in D&D Beyond that your DM could actually check, uh, and so you don't have to remember all of it. I I will say, the ability to mouse over things and find out what they are was just a life-changing innovation. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's so good. Am... No more paper cuts from and getting Doritos <laughs> all over the books. <laughs> um, I may still get Doritos over some of the books, but you know, sure, now sure. I have a second version that is pretty much Dorito proof. Lauren himself uh -huh. asks, are expensive material components of spells something mm. that you would negotiate changing for flavor? That's so interesting. For spellcasters in particular, my personal rule is uh, like we, we stick with verbal and somatic components because those can be affected by grappling or uh, different environments and things like that. Uh, but I almost always ignore material spells or material components. <laughs> Uh, and that's just because it becomes inventory management the game, and for some people, that could be very interesting. Uh, and if that's the case, I would say negotiate with your DM. Um, but for, for instance, with Ricky, all of his stuff was alchemically based, and I would just make up the ingredients. Because in Dungeons & Dragons, there are material ingredients, and there are actual things that you could use as inspiration for what the spells look like. And I think that would be a good idea, but um, definitely don't be afraid to throw out rules like encumbrance or uh, material <laughs> components or even maybe a talk of opportunity. I don't know. Go wild. It's your own table. <laughs> but it's something that everyone's agreeing to as a group. Yeah, and it could, if you decide to play strictly with that stuff, it could also open its own story possibilities where you could decide oh, yeah. that the diamond you need for your spell is only a certain color of diamond that comes out of one yes. area. And if you work with your DM on that, they may be able to be like, all right, here's some pressure I have to exert over your characters that you are going to need to take this job because that's the only person who has the kind of diamonds that you need. Uh, yep. And uh, now you're off to the, the story races. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this was from Relics and Rarities, and spoilers for the season, but uh, I knew the, the character would be collecting ingredients uh, here and there, and I had sp spoken about that with Deborah beforehand. We didn't know what was going to happen or what we were going to use them for, but we both thought it was kind of cool to have this through line through the episodes. And then, spoilers, one of the character fails enough death saves to die. Uh, and we decide that, oh, these ingredients that Ricky's been collecting can be used together with one special ingredient as a resurrection. And it just fit with the story so well. And it had nothing to do with what was actually required for a res spell, but it was interesting in the moment and created this character bond that was irreplaceable. And that yeah. is just about listening to what's actually happening at the table uh and if possible having a super rad dm and players around you absolutely oh. yeah that's <laughs> i've been so lucky <laughs> Ooh. one more type of thing that we uh before we get into our specific examples luxor 5013 are there any feats that you enjoy flavoring oh. to fit your character a little bit better Ooh, that is such a good question and i feel like um, I'm going to pull up my D&D Beyond account because um, Walt was probably a good example of that. Oh, okay. So halfling nimbleness as a feat, uh -huh. uh, that was a racial trait, but uh, was so useful as my dancing bard. Uh, <laughs> absolutely incredible. Uh, let me well, that was just, think. I was thinking, I don't think I've done a lot of flavoring of feats, but now I suddenly want to because it occurred to me there are so many fun things you could do with Lucky, for example. Um, exactly. Yeah, you could yeah, decide yeah. with your DM that that only operates while you have your coin or your uh, rabbit's foot or whatever it is. And that's, again, setting limitations for yourself. Like, there's no rule that says that or material component. You're imposing those own limitations, and that's creating the fun, like, weirdly enough. It's